Okay. Um, I think we're going to start. Uh, apologies for all this, <laughs> some technical difficulties here. Uh, thank you very much, Krista, for the uh, introduction. Uh, thanks very much. I very much look forward to this discussion. Um, and today I am going to be uh, presenting some work that I've been doing with some colleagues and collaborators over the last few years, where we're going to be talking about the influence of sign, uh, uh, like the different factors that influence sign language learning in hearing people who do not know any sign language at first exposure to sign language. Um, but first of all, before we start, I would just like to recreate a little bit like the situation in which hearing people that are starting to learn a sign language uh, would face. They would probably see a, a sign and they would try to figure out its meaning. So I'm going to show this example from Sign Language of the Netherlands. And for those of you who do not know the sign language, I would like to try to guess the meaning. What is the meaning of this sign? Well, it's probably really, it would be really difficult for you to accurately guess the meaning of the sign. The sign means present. And as a hearing person without any exposure to a sign language, this would be really difficult to, to know, right? Like, so there would be, be like specific instruction to get the, the, the meaning of this uh, particular lexical item. Um, but so what about this sign? Can you try to guess the meaning of the following sign? What can it mean? So this sign means baby. And probably if you are, don't know any sign language of the Netherlands, it would be easier for you to, uh, to guess this meaning. So this kind of situation, and this is kind of the context that, I am, uh, that I've been investigating over the last few years. In some cases, hearing people with no knowledge of any sign language get exposed to this type of signs. And in, in the case of the sign on the, on the left hand, present, that would be really difficult to guess the meaning. But for the other signs, like the case for baby, that would be a lot easier to guess. And that is because this, this sign is iconic. Yeah. So today in this talk, I will define iconicity as the direct relationship between uh, form and meaning. Yeah. Um, iconicity is a feature that has been observed in, in many moda in all the modalities of language. Uh, so, for instance, it has been used uh, has been uh, it's observed in uh, speech, in gesture, and in sign languages. So, to uh, to represent the concept of a baby in the spoken modality, uh, people may try to recreate the sounds uh, that are produced by babies. Uh, and in terms, for example, in gesture, some uh, speakers may try to recreate the action of actually holding a baby. And in sign languages as well, they can exploit iconicity and they also made use uh, the action of uh, cradling a baby to refer to this concept. So in this talk, what I'm going to be talking about is that the similarities in how gestures and sign exploit iconicity to refer to a concept are going to be really useful at first exposure to a sign language by hearing people. So, um, in second language research, there is, it is well established that in order to learn new vocabulary, uh, learners have to, ma uh, to link a linguistic form with its meaning. So, for instance, if I am learning Dutch, I would have to connect this string of letters or this string of sounds with a concept. So, I would have to learn that high means shark, right? So, like a li linking form with meaning. But for some words, uh, it would be easier uh, to make these four meaning mappings. If I come across with the Dutch word ocean, it would be very easier for me to really get the meaning because in my language, in my first language, Spanish, we have a word that is very similar to this and in many other languages as well. So, ocean or ocean. Um, so, um, these words, uh, ocean and ocean are called cognates because they have form and meaning similarities. And research has shown that these type of words are very good and very uh, they facilitate vocabulary learning in the context of of, uh, of second language research. However, all these claims about cognates have been made around uh, spoken languages, right? So an intriguing question is how this could happen uh, if, if something similar can happen when hearing people go on to learn uh, a sign language as a second language, in particular because it presents different channels of communication. 
So um, one of the most fascinating uh, topics in bilingualism is that of bimodal bilinguals. And in this talk, I will refer, uh, I will use this term to refer to hearing people who, le uh, who learn a spoken language natively, and then they go on to learn a sign language as a second language. We say that they are bilinguals because they are learning a second language, but we also call them, um, uh, some people tend to call them bimodals because they are learning an, a second language in a different modality. So speech versus sign. And some people have even claimed that these are uh, called L2, M2 learners. L2 referring to the second language, but M2 to refer to the second modality that people are learning. Yeah, uh, uh, like in, in the being able to express the um, uh, language in, in, a, in, a, in a visual gestural modality. So the question that is intriguing here is whether hearing people can re cannot really rely on their spoken lexicon uh, when they're making for meaning associations. So if they come across with a sign like this, present in sign language of the Netherlands, they cannot fall back on their speech, in, in, in my case, in my Spanish or in, uh, or in English, to access the meaning of these signs, right? Because of the differences in modalities. And a similar thing can happen for the signs like baby. However, um, um, over the last few years, one of the things that is really interesting here is that some of the signs can be iconic. Um, and the work that we've been carrying out over the last few years really tried to tap on how these different iconic and non-iconic signs can be learned by hearing non-signers. Yeah? So today in this talk, I will present a series of studies in which we try to really tease apart how iconicity and gesture can have a, a play a role in making four meaning as associations by hearing uh, by hearing adults learning a sign language as a second language. So the first study that I'm going to be talking about was carried out in collaboration with Gary Morgan and, and, and the Deafness and uh, ADICAL, Deafness Cognition and Language Research Center in London. And in this study, we were interested in investigating how hearing people learn the different constituents of signs and whether uh, iconicity played any role. So for those in the audience who are not familiar with sign language linguistics, it's important to know that signs have internal structure and they have meaningless constituents that when they're combined together, they um, create meaningful signs. So for the case of present in sign language of the Netherlands, it has a specific hand configuration, it has a location, a specific movement and an orientation. So all of these constituents are really important for uh, during um, sign language learning. Um, and um, one of the interesting things here is that whether we, we, we wanted to know how hearing people would learn these parameters and if iconicity plays any role. There is research that has shown that iconicity is, is uh, helpful to learn the semantics of science. And there, there has been shown a positive effect when it comes to uh, translations, uh, recall, and, um, and in other domains as well that relate to the meaning of science. But it was, it's not really clear how it can influence uh, the acquisition of the form of science. So in order to test this, uh, this, uh, um, this area of, of research, we carried out a sign repetition task. And it was very simple. Basically, we recruited uh, a group of uh, 15 hearing adults who just enrolled uh, in a course level one for British Sign Language. Uh, and they took part in a sign, uh, sign repetition task, where basically they were presented with different signs uh, and they had to imitate them as accurately as possible. Uh, and the idea behind this, um, this kind of technique is that when you see the errors that participants produce, those tend to be the constituents that are more difficult to learn during the process of lexical development. Um, in our task, we recruited, uh, we tested our participants in two sessions before they started their training in British Sign Language and then 11 weeks afterwards. And then the stimuli, the signs that they had to imitate uh, ha were a combination of um, 50, uh, sorry, 50% um, of the signs were iconic and the rest were uh, non-iconic. And also the signs had six different levels of complexity. Signs very, very, um, um, what we call level one were very basic in structure, signs in the second level were more complex and so on until we reached uh, level six.
Yeah. Uh, and what we did is that we asked participants to imitate the signs as accurately as possible. And then uh, we coded the renditions and we uh, we really um, we paid attention to the errors that they made. Um, and that would give us a really big, a, a big picture of what are the parameters that are more challenging for them to learn. And these are some of the results. On the horizontal axis, you will see each individual parameter, the hand shape, the location, the movement, and the orientation. And in the vertical axis, you will see the degree of accuracy. And one of the things that you can see is that hand shape was the most difficult parameter. That was like the, the most challenging and the most difficult to articulate. This was followed by the movement of the sign and then followed by orientation and location, which were the easiest ones to, uh, to learn to, and to articulate. Uh, another interesting um, uh, finding is that, of course, over time they improved because in session two, 11 weeks after learning, uh, after studying a sign of BSL, they improved compared to the first time before they had uh, received any kind of uh, instruction. And one of the interesting um, findings were the effect of iconicity. So here, again, in this graph, what we can see is the horizontal level uh, and the horizontal axis, you will see the six different levels of complexity of the signs, with number one being the simplest signs and number six being the, the, most, uh, the most complex in terms of structure. And in the vertical axis, you will see the degree of accuracy. And what you can see is that for arbitrary signs, things like present, this, uh, the level of accuracy main, maintains pretty stable across all the different levels of complexity. Yeah? And what's interesting is that iconicity had a negative effect because the more complex the structure of the sign, um, the more um, uh, the, the, the less accurate they were. So I'm going to repeat this. So the, uh, when the, 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 when signs were iconic and they became more complex phonologically in terms of structure, participants were less accurate at producing them. So this was an intriguing fact, finding because effectively iconicity did not help and actually hindered articulation of signs. So just to put these um, results in, in, um, in, in a broader context, we know that there's research that shows that iconicity helps the semantics of signs, but what we found is that iconicity actually hinders articulation. And the, uh, the explanation behind this uh, that we gave in this art article is that iconicity gives automatic access to the meaning of signs. So learners do not have to pay a lot of attention to the phonological form of, of each sign. So when, they, when participants saw arbitrary signs, they had never seen these signs before. It didn't have any semantic meaning around it. So they really had to pay attention on the form so that they could execute a sign more accurately uh, to the, so that they could imitate something. Whereas with iconic signs, they knew where the, uh, they probably had access to the meaning. So they produced a sign that kept the, the iconic motivation, but without paying attention to the exact phonological form. However, we, um, we didn't think that this was uh, uh, the whole story because actually when we paid attention to the signs and to the errors that participants made, we found that there were very systematic and recurrent errors. So I am going to show you an example uh, of the stimuli materials. So in one of the signs, participants had to imitate this sign uh, that is uh, the sign for um, airplane. And I would like you to pay attention to the hand shape of this sign. So as you can see, this uh, uh, the, the sign requires this specific uh, hand shape, yeah? And our participants saw this sign and they, they had to imitate it as accurately as possible. So this is the sign that um, uh, some of the examples of the renditions from our participants. Uh, I will just going to play uh, the whole renditions. And again, I'm going to ask you to pay attention to the specific hand configuration.
So as you can see, the errors, all the participants produce a very systematic error when it comes to the hand configuration of this gesture. So we were expecting that the participants would produce huge variation of, <clears throat> of hand shapes and movements, but we actually saw that there was there, these, these errors were very, um, uh, very, very recurrent. So we're wondering where could be the source of these, um, of these, uh, of these errors. And we thought that it was possible that they would come from gestures. Because we know that hearing people actually produce gestures, um, but the gestures that they produce do not have a specific uh, uh, structure. They do not have uh, specific components as signs do. So we were curious and intrigued whether actually what instead what people were doing, our participants were doing, was actually producing gestures in instead of imitating the signs that they were supposed to imitate. Um, but of course, this is a really difficult question to answer because um, we do not know what are the canonical or the typical gestures that people produce. If we are doing research in spoken languages, we have dictionaries and we have databases where we can just look what are the lexical, um, what is the structure of words and, and the sound uh, and phonological structure, but we don't know what gestures tend to produce. So this is exactly what we carried out. We tried to describe the gestures that are produced in a, in a speaking uh, community. And, in the, and that would be our stepping stone to understand whether those gestures were explo exploited at first exposure to a sign language. So this uh, study and the ones that I'm going to carry out from uh, from this point onwards were carried out in collaboration with Professor Asla Ozirek in uh, in the Donders Institute uh, and the Max Planck Institute in the Netherlands, uh, and this is a, a broader project that looked at how, the role of gesture during sign language learning. And in this particular study, we were interested in looking and describing the gestures that are produced by hearing people. So. Um, the idea behind this uh, study was just to try to figure out um, what are the concepts, what are the gestures that people produce? And we were interested in two elements. First of all, we were interested in knowing whether hearing people with no knowledge of any sign language produce uh, gestures that are consistent in form across the whole uh, community. And we also were interested in the type of iconicity that these gestures would have. Uh, and this would be, as I said, this would be our, on the, our description so that they could carry out studies about sign language learning. Um, when it comes to uh, the different types of iconicity, we know that iconicity can be used uh, in the manual modality to refer to different reference, but different, th th there are different types of iconicity. So for instance, in order to recreate the concept of a baby, we can use a, strat uh, a strategy that can, uh, has been referred to as acting, where the body represents the body. So in this case, I am recreating the, 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 the bodily motion of holding a baby. Yeah, but the body, then this is really important, the body represents the body. There is another strategy that is called representing in which the body does not really represent the body, but it represents some features of the referent. So in this example, two fingers may represent, not the, my fingers, but the legs of someone descending a hill. Another type of iconicity in this modality is the tracing, where the body actually is not used to represent the body, but to outline the shape of the reference, as is the case of a house. And another type of iconicity is called something that people have called personification, in which, again, the body does not represent the body, but it actually uh, is used to map features of the referent. So in this case, I can refer, refer to an eagle um, by mapping uh, its wings onto my body. So in our study, something that is really prevalent is that um, acting uh, the acting strategy is going to be really, really important. So in this study, in our elicitation, what we did is that we asked hearing people, 20 Dutch people with no knowledge of any sign language, to come up with their gesture uh, when they saw a word on the screen. So they would sit in front of the laptop, they would see a word, and they would have four seconds to come up with a gesture. Yeah, uh, and then the next that would come up with a, uh, the, the next word would come up, and the only rules were that they could not point at anything in the room, and they could say pass, 
if they didn't have, uh, if they could not come up with a gesture. Yeah. So I am going to show you a video clip of one of our participants. And he's going to produce a gesture for a butterfly. Then he will come up, he will say pass because he cannot come up with a, with a gesture. And then he will produce gestures for a plane, a uh, hoover, uh, or a vacuum cleaner in other countries. And uh, finally, they will produce the, the gesture for swimming. Okay, so we asked our 20 participants to do this task. And one of the things that we found is that, surprisingly, we found that for many, many concepts, participants were very consistent in the forms that they produced. So in the top row of this image, you can see that for the concept of telephone, participants produce the same gesture and with the same gestural form, with the same hand shape and with the same location and, and different features of the gesture. For some other concept, like on the second row, you could see that not everybody performed the same gesture, but still a, a, a large proportion of the group did. In this case, participants were trying to come up with a gesture for breaking, and a lot of a lot of them produce something that refers to breaking something at some tube-like form. But some participants just decided to smash an object on the floor. Um, but nonetheless, we still saw that there was a lot of systematicity in the gestures produced by people. And of course, there were some concepts that of, they did not elicit a systematic gesture. In the case of cooking, for this case, some people decided to fry, to come up with a gesture that referred to frying uh, something or like stirring a spoon or seasoning or different elements. So we could not find systematic gestures for this concept. But nonetheless, out of all the concepts that we um, um, used, 109 uh, concepts elicited systematic gestures. Uh, the, with a, a consistent form across all the participants. Uh, and something that is also really interesting, and again, I'm going to be referring back to this point again and again, is that the relevance of the acting strategy, where the body represents the body. Because we found that almost 70% uh, of, um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the gestures tend to use this acting strategy. And this is really important because it will show that, um, that this is a very uh, productive strategy when um, uh, gesture production and also in sign language learning. So um, this database um, is available for everybody to use in the Open Science Framework. We have created uh, videos of the silent gestures produced by hearing uh, by Dutch speakers. So please feel free to use them for your own experiments. But the key points that I want to highlight here are, first of all, that the finding is that participants actually hearing people produce a relatively large number of, uh, of gestures for some concepts. And these gestures have very similar forms across participants. And the other one is that there is a high prevalence of the acting strategy where the body represents the body. Um, so once we had this database, we already had like the first stepping stone towards experiment to answer the bigger question. We could, we have the characterization and description of the gestures produced by hearing people. Now we could answer the question whether they are exploited during sign language learning at first exposure. And the first experiment that we carried out was, um, uh, we did it in collaboration with Professor Asla Ozurek uh, and with Annika Schivner, who was an intern at the time and now is currently doing uh, a PhD in our new project. And in this study, we were trying to really tease apart this question, whether uh, gestures are exploited to guess the meaning of signs. So at this point, what we knew was that hearing people have a set of gestures that are very systematic across people. So again, like in the top row, you can see that participants have a very similar gestural form for the concept of T which reflects the dipping of the tea bag in the mug. 
and underneath a similar gesture for butterfly that reflects a like flapping of the hands. However, when we compare it with the sign language, we have two different things. In some cases, the gestures and the sign for the same concept overlap in form and in meaning, as is the case of tea. Both signs and silent gesture reflect the dipping of a tea bag in a mug. But if you see, there's something different when it happens with the, in the second in the bottom row. You can see that for butterfly, gestures tend to use one strategy of flapping the hands, but the sign in sign language of the Netherlands is significantly different. So the key question here is whether these similarities with gestures are used for uh, to access the meaning of signs at first exposure. So in this experiment, we recruited a, a, a different group of hearing people with no knowledge of any sign language, and we showed them signs that overlapped in different degrees uh, with their gestures. So we had basically three conditions. We can see that we show them signs with, at the top row that we call with full overlap because the form of the gesture and the sign overlap completely. So the features were the same. In the second row, you can see uh, signs that we call partial overlap because there was one feature between gesture and sign that was different. So in, in sign language of the Netherlands, we can see that for the concept to saw, we uh, the sign that produced this extended hand shape, whereas gestures produce pretty much the same gesture, but the difference is that they showed a closed fist. So there are two, there are differences in the hand shape. So that's why we call this condition partial overlap because the form is, is not entirely the same. And in the bottom row, we found that uh, we, the, the other condition where there was no overlap between the form of the gesture and the sign. So the sign for laptop in sign language of the Netherlands has this form and it reflects the shape of the laptop. Whereas hearing people would produce a gesture of typing for the same concept. OK, and the experiment was very simple. We had two dependent variables. One of them was the accuracy in guessing the meaning of a sign and also the iconicity ratings. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. I'm going to show you one trial just to show what, what our participants did. So first of all, we showed them a sign and they had to guess the meaning of it. So let's uh, let, I'm going to play one sign. Participants would see the sign only once. And then they would see something like this. Please think of the meaning of the sign you just saw and write only one word. And participants would have to type the actual uh, word that they thought it was. After that, we would provide the meaning and then we would ask them to rate the sign. So we would say thing, there would be a screen that says the translation for the sign is to put clothes on. How much does the sign look like its meaning? And they would have to rate on a scale from one to seven. One being like it doesn't look at all, meaning that it's not very iconic or seven uh, to represent that it really it's very clear with them um, um, or the the, um, uh, the the form really represents its meaning. Okay, and these are the results. Okay, so these is what we call um, uh, rain cloud plots. Uh, so these are a little bit different uh, from the traditional uh, bar graph. So I'm going to try to just uh, walk you through the results. In the horizontal axis, what you can see is the proportion of accurate responses, and it goes from zero to one. Yeah, and on the vertical axis, you have the three different conditions: signs with full overlap that overlap with the gesture, signs that overlap just a little bit with the gesture, and signs that did not overlap at all. And the way to understand these graphs is like the thickness or the width of the cloud is going to represent density of more data points. So all these little dots represent data points, and it would like the thicker the, the, the cloud would mean that there's more concentration of these data points.
So in the bottom uh, cloud, the pink one, you will see that there's high density towards the left end of the scale. So towards the zero or 0.1 values. And this means that for this condition, when signs did not have any overlap with the gesture, participants were not great. They actually were really, really poor in guessing the meaning of the signs. So just like a proportion of 0.1% of the data of this condition were, was accurately guessed. However, in the other two conditions, in full overlap and in partial overlap, you can see that the thickness of the cloud is more um, even across the whole scale. And this suggests that participants were more accurate at guessing the meaning of, of signs in these conditions because of the overlap with their gesture. And there is no difference between these two conditions, signs with full overlap and with partial overlap. Okay, and then when it comes to iconicity ratings, we found very similar results. When you hear what we see is the horizontal axis, we have like the scale of iconicity from zero to seven, uh, where seven is higher iconicity and one is no iconicity. And again, we see in the vertical axis, our three different conditions. And what you can see here is a similar pattern. In the bottom graph, uh, in the pink cloud, you can see that most of the uh, ratings are skewed towards the left with values between one, two, three. Um, so g our participants gave low uh, iconicity ratings to signs that did not overlap with gesture. And what you see is the opposite in the other two conditions. When we see signs that have full and partial overlap with gestures, our participants tend to, to give higher scores. And you can see them with a higher density towards the right side of the, of the graph. This, and an additional analysis that we carried out after we published these studies is that we really wanted to know what type of iconicity was prevalent in this um, in these in our three conditions and we focus in particular with this acting strategy like when the body represents the body and what we found is that for this for in the condition uh, where there was no overlap only 29 percent of our items had this acting strategy but if in contrast, what we see is that signs that have full and partial overlap, they have significantly more, with like between 63 and 79 percent of the signs uh, representing uh, where the body represents the body. So, in summary, for these results, what we saw in uh, what, uh, what the data that I can uh, that I just presented is that when there is an overlap between sign and gesture, it really helps people. Like the similarities between the sign and the gestures really helps non-signers to guess the meaning of signs. Uh, and actually, one of the things that I'm really proud about in this study that we carried out is that this was. Um, this was an open closed experiment. Um, stu our participants did not have to pick a choice out of um, a selection. It was not, not a multiple choice or like a voice choice learning task. Participants actually had to come up with their own guess, which is quite rare in this type of learning studies. Um, and another really important thing here is that this, the overlap between sign and gesture really helps predict the degree of iconicity. The more a sign looks like a gesture, the higher the iconicity rating people are going to uh, assign. And we also find that there was a strong bias to assume that the signs refer to actions. Some of the things that we notice is that our participants tend to make direct mappings to the to the to the sign. So this is the sign for monkey. which is similar in many sign languages. Um, and our participants, instead of saying that it was monkey, they used made a direct mapping. So they refer to scratching. Mm -hmm. And in very in lots of in several occasions, they also made the wrong abstraction. This is the sign for spoon. In sign language of the Netherlands, but a lot a lot of our participants actually thought that this was the sign for eating, 
Mm -hmm. um, so again, and, and another point that is really important to highlight here is that uh, it seems, uh, we, and this is something that we analyzed afterwards, that it seems that it is the acting strategy that is easier um, to recognize uh, and uh, that is it's possibly what makes our participants um, make it, yeah, to, to, to have easier access to the meaning of signs. Okay. So, um, but of course, after these studies, we decided to also carry out electroencephalography, um, to electroencephalography (EEG) um, to uh, triangulate our behavioral findings. And uh, this was a work in collaboration with again uh, Asla Ozirek and with David Peters. Uh, and we used event-related potentials to really figure out whether uh, there was a specific brain signal. Um, that could reflect this, um, that sign, uh, non-signers recognize signs that, ref that look similar to gestures. So in a nutshell, what we, want, we, what we predicted is that um, the brain would create very specific signals when recognizing that some signs had overlap with gestures. So I will try to keep the, I don't know the, the audience here, so I'm going to try to keep the technical vocabulary to a limit. Um, but basically some of the things that we need to know is that this is the way that we carry out EEG studies. We place a cap in our participants and these little sensors on the cap record the electrical activity that's coming out from the scalp of our participants when they are uh, perceiving certain input. Um, and the idea is that when participants saw signs that overlap and did not overlap with the form of the gesture, the brain would produce very specific and clear signals. And these are, uh, uh, there are like several signals and several components in, the, um, in this literature. But the ones that we were interested in were two. One of them was called, it is called the P300. So it, in a nutshell, it's basically like we uh, brain, um, the brain signals produce this, uh, this component uh, when uh, we perceive unexpected stimulus, something that is novel or something that we did not expect. And we also focused on the N400, another component that signals when something is really difficult to process or semantically difficult to process. So. What does this mean in our in terms of our experiment? Our participants saw two types of signs in this case. And one of these types of signs was like laptop. This sign does not, uh, this like in the case of laptop, has low overlap with the gesture uh, that people produce in the Netherlands. So what we expected is that when they saw signs like laptop, this would be something completely unexpected for them because this is not what the way they would uh, gesture the same concept. So for this reason, we expected that there would be an enhanced P300 because this is something that is unexpected and novel, but also we expected to have an N400 as well, because this would be more difficult to process in principle, because this is not in line with the gestures that people produce. And then when we presented signs like key, our participants, our prediction was that this would be, um, this would, uh, has an overlap with the gesture and therefore is something that would be expected. So in that case, we expected our participants to have a reduced P300 because this sign was expected in the basis of their gesture. And we also thought that we would have a reduced N400 because it would be easier to process given the similarities between gesture and the signs. So we recruited another group of hearing non-signers for another um, experiment. Uh, and um, um, it consisted of the four different blocks. In the first block, we had participants like the one you showed uh, earlier with a cap, um, and they saw signs with high and low overlap for the first time. And we measured brain activity at this point. After this, we concluded this block. We then asked our participants to learn the signs. And we did this by asking them to see the sign three times and to imitate the sign each time they saw it. After the, this intensive training, we showed them the signs again, once, once at a time, and we measured brain activity here. And then in the final block, 
we tested them. We wanted to know whether they learned the signs or not. Uh, and we did this by, sh instead of showing them the sign, we showed them the translation in Dutch. So we would show them the, the word butterfly and they would have to come up with the sign that they've learned. Something that is just important to, to highlight and, and, and repeat here is that we only measure brain signals in the first exposure when they had never seen any signs before and then again after the intensive training. Uh, and the structure of the trial looks something like this. When they saw signs with high overlap, they saw a fixation cross in the middle of the screen. Then they saw the, the word T. And based on this word, we thought that they would um, start creating expectations about the form of the sign based on their gestures. They would uh, see um, fixation cross again, and then they would see the sign. Mm -hmm. And the same form of the trial would be for the signs that did not have overlap with gesture. Yeah? And all the signs were presented uh, in randomized order. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now in terms for the results, uh, I, again, I am going to keep all the technicalities to, uh, to, uh, um, to the minimum. Um, but what we can see here is um, in the red line, we can see the, um, let's say, the elect uh, electrical current, as it were, um, and the different components. In red, you can see the signs with low overlap, and in black, the signs with high overlap. And what we see is that um, there is a difference uh, in the P300. And what we saw is that indeed um, there was an enhanced P300 for signs that with uh, low overlap, suggesting that they were uh, not expected. And then that they definitely elicited the, uh, on, um, the P300 based on the, on the stimulus that was completely unexpected. But we did not see any differences in the N400. So signs with high and low overlap with gestures were easy to process for them. When we look at the results after uh, uh, the block three, uh, and this is again when they, after re learning the signs for um, intensive training of the signs, we saw that all the effects disappear. Yeah, They do not rely on their gestures anymore. The signs are not unexpected. And that, that's that what makes the sign, um, uh, the differences in the P300 to disappear. So um, one other thing that I just carried out recently is again to looking at the prevalence of this uh, acting strategy. Um, what we found was that um, when signs had low overlap with gesture, we found that there was like only 22% of the stimulus materials had this acting strategy. And in contrast, I mean, it's not a lot as in the previous studies, but um, there was like 53% of the signs that had this acting um, type of iconic representation. So just to summarize a little bit all these results, um, at first exposure, what we found is that when signs overlap with gesture, um, um, then there's it is expected stimuli. So they see signs that look like their gestures, so th they are expected stimuli. So they expect the signs to have this form. So that's why we did we found a reduced P300. And this also made the signs easy to process. That's why we find also a reduced N400. Mm -hmm. However, something that is really interesting is that when signs did not overlap with gesture, they were regarded as unexpected stimuli. We really believe that our, our participants were creating expectations of the form of the signs based on their gestures. And when this, um, this expectation was not met, matched, then that's when it elicited an, um, an enhanced P300 that signals unexpected stimuli. And something that was really surprising is that we found no simil no um, uh, that that these signs were also easy to process. We did not we found a reduced N four hundred, and this is really important um, uh, because both type of signs both are iconic, right? The sign key is iconic because it reflects how a key is manipulated, but the sign laptop is also um, easy to process because it reflects the shape of a laptop. So because these two signs are iconic, we believe that this is the reason why we found a reduced N400. Both type of signs are easy to process. And now when we look at the uh, results after intense um, sign learning, we find that the effects disappear. 
like when our participants learned the signs, we found that there was no longer an unexpected um, uh, result here. And finally, um, one thing that is really important, and I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to this point, is that in the high overlap condition, we find that there is a higher prevalence of the acting strategy. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up all these studies and try to tease apart different um, different type of findings. Um, at the beginning of this talk, what I wanted to, to describe is trying to explore and to, to, to really investigate how is it that hearing people with no knowledge of a sign language start making associations between form and meaning. Um, we said that um, they cannot really rely on the on the words in their spoken language because of the differences in modality. Um, but actually, another thing that is really important is that our participants do not really, they're not really like blank slates because they have some knowledge that actually helps them uh, access the meaning of signs, uh, even though they have never been exposed to a sign language. And that's because they can rely in, in signs and gestures. So going back to this um, four meaning associations at first exposure to sign language, one of the key findings is, first of all, that we found that iconicity hinders the production of signs. Um, and we argue that this has to do with that um, the iconicity is really rich and um, um, we don't really need to pay attention too much in the phonological form. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail in this in a, in a second. But these systematic errors that we saw in iconic signs for he by hearing people gave us the notion or like this idea that it is possible that maybe they were producing gestures instead of producing signs. Um, when we described the gestures of speaking communities to see if there is any influence when they're learning a sign language, we actually found that hearing people have a very um, systematic and somewhat consistent gestural repertoire for many concepts. Not for, uh, not for all concepts, but they actually do for many, many concepts. And the other set of findings is that when we have behavioral and electrophysiological evidence to suggest that when there are similarities between the gestures of the speaking community and the sign, that actually facilitates learning and it also help, uh, predicts people's um, iconicity ratings. Yeah. And as I said, it's really important. These are not just behavioral results, but the brain is sensitive to the similarities between signs and gestures. So um, teasing apart all these different findings, uh, when we think that during um, second language learning or language learning in general, uh, one of the key findings, and I think that we really need to delve into this a little bit more in language sciences, is that iconicity hinders production. We're at the point where we really have to really tease apart whether and how iconicity helps. And one of the things that are, are really prevalent, at least in our studies, is that the um, meaning does help um, sorry, iconicity does help in meaning, um, but it doesn't necessarily help in the phonological aspect because iconic signs uh, in in the broader domain they are rich. They have rich iconic, um, sorry, semantic content, so phonology becomes less relevant. And there is evidence from sign language studies that um, indeed we find that um, when there are studies when when a task requires to make decisions about the form of a sign iconic signs seem to have an inhibition they do they are good for iconicity is very good for semantic processing but not for phonological processing in the realm of gestures uh, uh, gesture studies there is also evidence that shows that i when hearing people are learning a second language, when they're presented with an iconic gesture, um, they are really good at iconic gestures help learning the semantics of the word, but they cannot really, they do not help in learning the phonological structure of the word, when, especially when it's a, a complex uh, structure. Um, and similarly, uh, in developmental studies, there is evidence that iconic uh, and iconic words, and in specific in onomatopoeias, the flexibility or the flexible um, 
the rich semantic content of onomatopoeias, but also the flexible phonological form is actually really useful for children that haven't developed a phonological structure and yet they can use them for communicative purposes. This flexibility is, is really important. And here I would like to really go back to the, the main claim of the study, um, that iconic gestures act as manual cognates as first exposure to a sign language. Um, cognates have been traditionally defined as structural units. There are words, they, are, they have sem semantic similarities, and they also have some form similarities, like the example of ocean that I explained at the beginning of the talk. Um, and these cognates really show that uh, automatic access to the meaning of science in second language learners, and they show facilitating processes. But these claims and these definitions have been made around spoken words. Uh, and I think that this is where the time where we can expand or broaden our lens. And when we take into consideration uh, sign languages and gestures, we can see that iconic gestures and iconic signs have the same behavioral uh, and electrophysiological behaviors as, uh, as co cognates in spoken languages. But I would really appeal to people to just like broaden uh, this definition uh, to the realm of, of the manual visual modality. And maybe we can start reconsidering that there are some form of manual cognates that iconic gestures are also manual cognates when uh, people are learning a sign language as a second language. And these findings are, have, I think, uh, broader implications in other domains as well. Um, we um, we know that we have been talking, there's a lot of research about sign languages and gestures, but I think that it's um, we, we have to really start delving a little bit more about what is the relationship between these two systems in different populations, because see, we can see that there's a lot of interaction between them. So there is work from Karen Emery and their colleagues who've investigated and, co and, uh, uh, and investigated extensively the phenomenon of code blending. And this refers to the phenomenon where hearing people who know, who are fluent in a sign language, they tend to produce uh, signs, even though they can be speaking to people that do not know any sign language. So in this uh, clip, which I really, really like, shows that um, uh, this person is describing a cartoon and then all of a sudden she produces the sign measure in American sign language. And uh, Karen Emery and her colleagues have described this uh, unintentional intrusions of ASL, American Sign Language, when people are speaking. And the results that we're presenting here are something similar, but the other way around. We think that what is happening here is that our hearing people, our participants, were producing unintentional intrusions of gestures while signing. Um, so this, I think, is a really, really rich and fertile area of research where we can really see to what extent signs and gestures interact. I don't really see them as separate um, uh, systems. I actually see them that they're very interconnected and that there's a lot of influence from one to the other. And that's one of the reasons why I would really like to continue the conversation about L2M to learners. I don't really think that learners of a sign language as a second language are really learning a second modality. I think that they already have it and they're just learning it in the, um, uh, they're just exploiting it during uh, first exposure to sign language. And finally, like another really important part of these uh, of these studies, and I think that they really need attention from the sign language community, is what is the role of the body um, in, in different uh, processes in sign languages. Um, we know that the body uh, is used, uh, uh, the body and action is used as to scaffold and, and to create analogies with the world. And it's a really, really important bridge for language. And in spoken languages, there's this really vast body of research that knows and acknowledges that the body is pr fundamental for language learning and language processing. And I don't think that this has been delved into in sign languages as much. So we know that um, we actions can be used um, um, like for functional purposes, but these actions can also be used by sign languages and gestures uh, for symbolic purposes. And I think that we really need to know what these actions, re, uh, representations of actions can um, be really mean in gesture and sign languages. So in the case of 
we can use actions to create symbols like, you know, in the gesture of getting the bill in some cultures. And in some sign languages as well, we can see that this action can be used to refer to pens uh, in Turkish sign language, for example. And I think it's these bodily actions really play an important role in sign languages. And I think that we really need to delve into this a little bit more. Um, for example, we have some evidence that shows that these uh, signs that represent bodily actions play an important role in sign language learning. So in Turkish sign language, as in many sign languages in the world, there are different lexical variants for the same concept. So this is the sign for bed in, in Turkish sign language. And in one variant, the sign represents the shape of the bed but in the other variant represents the action associated with the bed. And what we found in one of our studies is that actually deaf children have a very strong preference for the variant that represents the action associated to the, to the reference, whereas adults prefer the other one. So there seems to be like a preference because the body, this is the sensory motor experiences of children can facilitate this mapping and makes, uh, may facilitate uh, language, sign language learning. And another really important domain about the relevance of bodily actions is that it can be used to, to create the lexicons of the sign languages, not only for concrete objects, but also for abstract concepts. So we know that, for example, in many sign languages, in this case, uh, Italian sign language, um, we can use bodily actions to represent uh, things like holding or grasping, but also abstract concepts like remember. The sign of remember in many sign languages, including Italian sign language, reflects like the grasping or the holding of something around the, the head. So this is really important finding because we are using the body to create the lexicon, even for abstract concepts. And this is actually really important. And this is something that we are currently investigating right now. Uh, we have a collaborative work with this phenomenal team with Pamela Pernis and our group uh, in Cologne and here in the UK, where we're actually looking at all the different iconic strategies that are used in the lexicons of German Sign Language and British Sign Language. And some of our preliminary findings is that um, iconicity is really prevalent, but importantly, um, signs referring, like using the acting strategy where the body represents the body, takes up approximately to 25% of the lexicon in the tasks that we, that we have carried out so far, which is really, really substantial if we think about it. But these are preliminary results and of course more is to follow. Yeah. And now I would like to just conclude by saying that um, our field of, of learning a sign language as a second language is really emerging. We're re in infancy compared to the spoken modality, but there are more and more studies like the ones uh, presented here on the, on the slide. And interestingly, there are some slowly, some, uh, some studies that take into consideration uh, the gestural element, which is actually something really important. Um, so so um, this is a really, really exciting times because I think that we are seeing like the, our, this, this field is, is really growing. Uh, but it, I think it's really important. I think and this is something like kind of the take home message that I would like to put there that we really should take into consideration the gestures that hearing non-signers bring to the classroom, but also to take into consideration specifically uh, all the iconicity that refers to actions and how that this is represented and what are the effects that we can find in learning and processing. Okay, I'm, I'm literally just like one hour, so I'm very happy that I was on the dot. Uh, I would just, uh, this work that I've just presented here is not like an individual's work, it's a collaboration of many, many people. And I would like to thank all of these people on the slide and all the institutions where I have carried out these studies uh, and the funding agencies. And I very much look forward to um, discuss uh, with uh, Krista and with uh, everybody in the audience. So uh, thank you very much.
All right, have we got the sign language interpreters in place here? Great, let me start over. So firstly, I want to thank you so much for your informative and interesting presentation. I know that we have encountered each other at different conferences and workshops throughout the years. And I have always enjoyed our discussions and I've always learned a lot from your work. I think the work that you've presented today is so important in how your research findings impact so many different aspects of second language acquisition, of things like how people communicate, how they acquire language. And so I appreciate your presentation today. I know that in the field of second language acquisition, when it comes to sign language, there isn't that much research. I would say maybe in the past 10 years, we have seen a growth similarly to what you mentioned. I also find it interesting when people look at sign language as second language acquisition, that's where my work lies as well. I agree with the points that you've made about how we can look at this from a linguistics point of view and also an EEG point of view. And so I appreciate you bridging that gap and making that connection. Now I've got some questions for you here today. Um, and once I'm done, I will be happy to hand it over to the host to bring along or bring in questions from the audience. So one moment, let me take a look at my notes here. So again, similarly to you, I have also studied M2L2 learners for a while now. And that means I take a look at new language, new acquisition for new modalities as well. And so a lot of my work has been in that L2, M2 field. And I actually have a new project that is going to be starting about Swedish sign language learners as M1, L2. We've actually taken a look at one sign language, but now we'll take a look at learners learning a second sign language. So that's why it's just one modality. And that speaks to the work that we've done with second language acquisition between you and I. So I am wondering about your results that you found when it comes to hearing people learning L2s in general. What we found there, I'm wondering how that works for deaf people learning a second sign language. Like what is the difference between hearing learners of a second language and deaf learners of a second language? Are there similarities and are there differences? A question I've pondered is that when it comes to Swedish sign language, this sign that you see me doing here What I've noticed is that if there's a person from Syria who is trying to learn Swedish sign language, and they're also a signer, their sign is. And both of these are for to drink. And in teaching the Syrian signers Swedish sign language, we have to reinforce the differences between drink for their sign language and ours. And to me, a thought we have is maybe the sign in Swedish sign language for drink might be a little bit more transparent. And that hearing learners might be able to catch that a little bit easier because it relates to the gesture that they do. And so I am curious on your thoughts about M2, L2 learners versus M1, L2 learners. Okay, well, th and thank you, Krista. This is, thank you very much for, uh, for this discussion. And uh, wow, this is uh, a really interesting domain that it's, if our field is small, this is even less unexplored. So it's fantastic that you're carrying out this research. Um, 
I think that the, my general, um, when my general, my, my idea is that actually um, this is not surprising because um, iconicity indeed um, is not necessarily just the mapping between the form and meaning, but there are some conventions um, around, and this is something that we can see uh, in our hearing people. Um, and there we see that some cultural elements that are also really important here, right? So um, just to give an example with a, a T in the Netherlands, um, that is a very rooted tradition of drinking tea and that's that's the way they 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 do it so um they learners from no matter what um that whether they are hearing or deaf and um, they already have some existing knowledge uh and they can be in the form of their cultural practices like the way they they drink tea or it could be their gestures as well and they bring that to the um, to the classroom, um, and they are already they're going to make assumptions about the meaning of new signs based on their existing knowledge, based on their cultural practices, and based on their gestural knowledge. Um, and it's funny that you mentioned this because um, in different cultures, I think that in Turkey, this is also the gesture for drinking. And anecdotally, I have seen some of my colleagues when we were learning sign language of the Netherlands, that they would not produce this form, right? That this is a form that, that is like very culturally specific. Um, this is something that is more associated with other cultures. In Mexico, for example, this is the gesture that we use for drinking. We don't use something like this. So this also, um, this really, I think that what is really, I think that my message here or my idea is that we, I, iconicity doesn't, is, is, can really take us so far. But um, I think that we also have to remember that iconicity is something like very cultural specific. And that is something that is grounded within a culture, that is grounded within a context. And that associations that we make about form and meaning are not, are not universal. Iconicity is really, it changes from, from, from culture to culture, depending on the, um, on, on the, um, yeah, on, on the culture and on, on, on the culture and on the context. Great, thank you for your response. I've got another question here for you. So when I think about M2L2 for hearing learners who are then trying to learn sign language, I'm thinking about again, hearing signers who learn spoken language as a first language and then learn sign language as a second language and then acquire an L3. And so we have research into second language learning and we have that there, but I'm wondering what happens when it comes to L3 acquisition. Because I'm thinking about what experiences we can provide adult learners when they're learning a new language. We have those experiences when they adult learners learn their second language that they can then bring on to the third language that they learn and so on and so forth. So there are differences between learning your first language to your second language to your third language. So how does L2 shift into L3 and how does that influence the process? Now, if my L2 is a sign language that I'm learning, 
And then I add another sign language that I learned after that. What you can anticipate is that the L2 you've learned will impact the L3 that you learn, or maybe something earlier in the language learning process, maybe the iconicity carries over. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you have any knowledge that might address some of these interesting thoughts. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, this is also like a really, really fascinating area of research, and we don't really know what to expect, really. My my intuition here would be that, um, of course, learners become a lot more attuned to all the different properties of their languages, spoken languages and sign languages, um, and they become uh, more attuned to uh, knowing what is the information that they have to pay attention to, and what are the... Uh, the things that generalize and the things that do not generalize they become a lot more uh, experts uh, they become like real like linguists as it were um and there are factors that are not going to impact so negatively or let's say uh, in different ways so they 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 learn how to be flexible so <clears throat> I think that in this type of context, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps gesture is going to play a more limited role, perhaps, right? Because they know already a sign language and they know uh, the, the linguistic structure about sign languages. So that would be one possibility, right? Um, but I think that's something that is really important here is that, of course, um, well, these learners become experts and they have like a rich semantic um, repertoire uh, and sem sem uh, sorry, semiotic repertoire um, that they can draw from. So they have all these different devices um, and they can um, move on to the, to the following L3 and L4 um, with all this toolkit, as it were. So I don't think that it's, I don't see it like boxes, like the effect of, of one will disappear completely, but all of these are going to, all these different act um, interact and learners will become more proficient and more efficient and, you know, exploiting gesture, exploiting iconicity, understanding iconicity in production and in perception, um, spoken words and how they work. So I, I, I don't, I, I really see that, um, well, we need more research in this domain, but I really think that as they become more proficient in more sign and spoken languages, they are also experts. They become better experts, as it were, of all the semiotic resources that they have available to learn language. And they're capable of really understanding the systematicity or like the rules that govern um, all the sign and spoken languages. But again, like we really don't have any domain, uh, like we don't have any research in this domain, so that makes it really difficult to 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 make predictions. So that's why this is such a fertile uh, area of research. I agree. So that answer that you just gave me to my second question actually leads me to my next question. And actually, in fact, we have many unanswered questions in this research. And so with the research and the findings that you have encountered and done, what are you thinking is lacking or what would you like to know more about or what research are you planning to do in the future? What research do you have next? Um, well, I, I think um, that there is a lot to be done. Um, and actually, one of the things that I would really, really like to see happening, and, and you are doing it with your team in, in Stockholm, is actually paying attention to what happens in, in real classrooms, to do corpus work on the acquisition of a sign language as a second language. Because the experiments that I have described now 
are super controlled, super, um, uh, yeah, with very clear uh, experimental paradigms and uh, the stimuli are, uh, and the factors are very well manipulated in very fixed conditions, but we don't really know how this uh, translates into real practice in a real class classroom where a lot more factors play, in, play a role. Um, I would be really interested in, in knowing more about the role of mouthings. Uh, so what is the, you, you've carried out work on this domain and I think it's really important and interesting, like to what extent uh, the spoken language um, comes out and or how it is taught because it, mouthings are really important for the structure of sign languages but we don't know whether people are like holding it back or like do they do they have to express it how do they express it what are the cognitive skills that are related to that so that that is one domain that would be really important but also to really like going back to my previous point like what happens in in real settings what are the errors that participants make in the classroom when there are a lot more influences. Um, and there is really cool work also in, in the Netherlands uh, by Evelyn Boers. Um, in the Netherlands and like your work as well that is looking at what happens in the, in the classroom. So it would be really interesting for me to see whether the findings in, in the lab translate uh, to the um, uh, to the to the classroom and and more importantly one of the things I would really like to see is more applied research right like how do these findings develop into pedagogical materials for sign language learners if we argue that iconicity helps semantics and hinders uh, phonology like how can we create materials that are going to help participants in this domain. So I think that that would be the, my, my wish list for like immediate future, just like to see what happens in the, in the, in the, in the wild, in classrooms and to see more applied research. And in a more theoretical level, I would really be curious to see again, um, I mean, like learning, uh, seeing like these influences between science and gesture, um, I think that um, this is a really, really interesting domain. I think that we've always put sign and gesture in separate boxes that don't talk to each other. Um, but I, I think that we're getting more and more evidence that they actually int interact with each other uh, and that they change over time depending on the proficiency of sign language. So. I think that this is really crucial to really get a better understanding to know what is gesture, what is sign, what is the role of the body um, in uh, in these uh, in these types of communication and how this affects uh, language processing in the mind. Thank you so much. I do agree that it is really important to have multiple perspectives on research and having that lab research connect to more real life experience. I know that part of the question is hard to answer because if we just do natural research, if you will, in the wild, we might not have as much control over it. and. Of course, in the lab, it's easy to control the settings, but maybe not easy to answer all the questions. And it'd be great to have that research with applied research and be able to connect the two. And so I'm just gonna be mindful of time and pass this over to the audience to see if we have any questions coming from the audience. We do have two questions to start with. Allow me a moment while I place them. So the first question that we have from the audience is a question about the regularities between the process of learning a second language. If L1 and L2 are both in sign language, being one process, 
or another process where the L1 is a spoken language and the L2 is a sign language and vice versa. Between those three different makeups, are there regularities or differences between the process of learning those? <laughs> Oh my God, that's a really difficult question. Um, I would expect, I, I definitely um, expect some regularities in the errors. Uh, and I think that this is a really, um, this is a good time to really try to um, look in depth at, at these errors, not just to account for them, but try to find out where the errors are and what they could possibly mean. And this is what led us to really like this uh, avenue of research in, in the gestures. We found that some errors were very, very systematic uh, in the hand configurations. And we're like, where are these coming from? They're not random. And that is a really important lesson that we have to take from second language research. These errors do not happen randomly. They have very specific forms. So, I mean, it's really difficult to point at these really um, different scenarios because, of course, each of them are going to be really, uh, they're going to be different uh, and they're going to have like different complexities in their own. Um, but um, um, I think that we just have to really f try to Syst uh, to analyze and, and describe the errors and try to find um, where they're coming from. Um, I think that in terms of like when people are learning a sign, signers who are learning a second sign language, my expectation would be that there's going to be a lot of influence from their existing sign language. And I, a lot of the errors I would imagine that would come from from this specific sign language. I think that in general, I, I mean, I would, we definitely would need more research on this, but I think that um, overall the expectation or the prediction is that um, the, uh, the, the learners are going to fall back on what they already know, be it gestures, their sign languages, their spoken languages, and those are the resources that are going to draw from. And many of the errors that we see when they're learning a target language, whatever it is, they're going to be coming from these domains. Thank you. <clears throat> now, the second question also comes from the audience. And it's a question about deaf people. And the question is, what parameters do deaf people have more difficulty in learning? Do these difficulties vary according to the age in which the person starts to learn sign language? Mm. And that's mm. the question for you. Mm, yeah, Oof. yeah. There is. Yeah, again, I, I'm going to say that we need more research on this topic. Um, I think that we can. I, I, we could generalize that. Um, maybe like when we talk about the specific constituents of of, of signs, that um, they w there would be like some regularities across the board. So perhaps when we're thinking about handshape being more complex, uh, perhaps, and they would be more prone to errors. Um, but I think that there is another, another really important thing that we have to take into account. And this is something that we have a little project ongoing about it is individual differences. Um, so not only about looking as a whole population, but we're going to see that there are a lot of individual differences in in in, in the errors. Um, first of all, I don't think that. Okay, let me track back a little bit. I think that the deaf communities learning a sign language are going to come up with some errors that are going to be very typical of proficient signers. They're not going to make probably as many mistakes as hearing people with no knowledge of a sign language. Um, they're going to probably come up with errors that are more uh, aligned to the, you know, in line of the knowing a sign language. Probably they're going to substitute signs for their own personal signs. So maybe that would be uh, an example. And this is going to lead to some errors in the constituents and signs, but based on their own lexical repertoire. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Great, thank you. All right. I'm not sure if there are any more questions from the audience. I'm going to take a look here.
Ah, there are two more questions, great. So the comment from the audience says, thanks Gerardo for your very clear talk. And then this audience member says that it seems that some of these results could be relevant for the teaching of classroom settings where hearing people are there to learn sign language. Now the question from this audience member is, has anyone tried to apply the findings in this way to developing strategies for teaching sign languages? Do you know? There is, as far as I know, there is uh, limited work on that. Um, the, the, the first name that comes to mind is uh, uh, Evelyn Boers uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and she, she is a teacher of sign language of the Netherlands. And she has done some experimental work and she has implemented some of her uh, findings in the classroom. Um, um, but of course, it's this one example, uh, and I think that we need a lot more work in this domain. And especially, I, I think that we really need to collaborate a lot more with applied linguists, um, because then it, it would be a, we would be able, first of all, to figure out whether the findings that we have in the lab really translate to the classroom, and then how we can implement them to to improve our methodologies. That, that would be a really, but yeah, as far as I know, only Evelyn uh, comes to mind. And of course, a lot of people are really struggling with this because um, sign language research, sorry, uh, teachers of sign languages um, are based most of their teaching on their, on their intuitions. So it's really important that we actually take this research out and we try to, to create methodologies to, to facilitate learning. Thank you for that. And then there's one last question here from the audience. And in your talk, you mentioned how gestures can impact or influence sign language production. From your knowledge, do you think that these could be a kind of transfer from gesture to sign language? which we see commonly in second language acquisition. Yeah. We yeah. typically call that transfer. Do you yeah. agree with that? Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you think that's a good way to define what we see, especially in our research with bimodal bilinguals? Yeah, definitely. And thank you. Thank you very much for this question because uh, that's exactly the way that we have framed all these results, all these findings. We talk about this uh, transfer uh, from gesture into sign language, um, and I think that this is, um, and this is the reason why we think that I, I need that, that we need to talk a lot more to people in in the domain of second language research, because a lot of the findings and a lot of the topics that they have uh, talked about just refer exclusively to spoken languages and they have defined things like transfer um, and cognates within a, one la spoken language to another spoken language. Um, and I think that that's because we, like traditionally in all the language sciences, we have taken a very kind of um, skew perspective of only looking at spoken languages. Uh, and now, fortunately, we're expanding our horizon and we're broadening the lens and we're taking multimodality a lot more serious and we're taking into consideration sign languages, we're taking into consideration uh, gestures. Um, so I'm a very, very strong advocate to actually start the conversation about transfer because transfer and cognates, at least in the evidence that we have here, does not only apply to spoken languages, it's not only from Dutch to Spanish. We see that this happens outside what a lot of people have traditionally talked about, linguistic domains, right? It comes from anything. It comes from gestures. It comes from sign languages. And there's a lot of influence. 
um, between them. So indeed, yeah, I uh, totally, uh, and this is how we have written it in some of our papers. We talk about gestural transfer um, and Karen Emery has talked about this as intrusions uh, um, of, of signs. So I think that we, in, in in the domain of second language research, we really have to think a little bit more uh, about these definitions of cognates and transfer, but taking into consideration uh, gestures and sign languages. Because one of the things that I've been trying to argue, especially in the last slides, is that cognates and this transfer is... Um, they have like iconic gestures and sign language and iconic signs have the same behaviors. They can be replaced and they can be easy to access uh, facilitation in processing. Um, the only thing that hasn't been taken into account is that they are part of a gestural system or a sign language system. So we really, I really think that we have to start talking a little bit more about this and say that spoken languages are one domain, but language is more, much more than that. And it's a multimodal in nature. And in this sense, these notions, if we're talking, we know that there is second language acquisition in other domains, in the manual visual modality. So we really have to broaden our definitions to incorporate this domain as well. Great, thank you. That was such a great response. And I can see that we do not have any additional questions from the audience. And so since your talk is over, we've had our questions and answer session. I really appreciate this conversation. I appreciate your presentation. We got such great questions from the audience. And so I wanna thank you, Gerardo. And I also want to thank Arbelin for hosting this on StreamYard, and then I think that that means this uh, talk has come to a close. Thank you so much. And yes, Gerardo, would you like to say something? Yeah. I would also like to to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Krista um, who, uh, for agreeing to be a, a discussant in our in, in this talk um, because it's uh, you are one of the leading experts in the acquisition of sign language as a second language in in Stockholm. So a lot of interesting work. So it's it's an honor to discuss uh, to discuss this work with you, uh, and also because with these kind of platforms we're getting visibility of. Uh, of the deaf community and the field of second language research. So we're making noise and, and, and it's really great. Uh, I would also like to precisely thank Aberlin for organizing this series because they're like reach every corner or a lot of corners in the world in these uh, days that we're living. So it's fantastic that we can continue with uh, academic and intellectual conversations despite all the adversity. So thank you to the organizers of this platform. Um, uh, and also importantly, thanks to the interpreters <laughs> for uh, their phenomenal work, uh, for helping us out and to allow like um, uh, communication between deaf and hearing communities. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>